Hi, good morning, everyone. It's good to be back at WLPC. I think it's a different crowd compared to the last one in Phoenix. So today I'm going to talk about a feature called Special Reuse, which has been part of the 11AX standard. And the idea is to give you sort of a demystify some of the things that are laid out in the spec and to give a better understanding of what are the different flavors of Special Reuse. Before I go there, just a quick recap of you know, some of the key features which are part of the 11AX spec. I have divided them into four parts. So there are features which target spectral efficiency, such as 1024 QAM, which gives you more bits per symbol. Then there is MIMO, 8 cross 8 in both uplink, downlink. You have longer WebDM symbol, again gives you more bits per second. Then you have features which are targeted towards high density, like OFDMA, you have special reuse, which we'll see in more detail, and 6 GHz, of course, which gives you more spectrum, more channels, and more capacity. Then for extending the range of Wi-Fi, we have a longer CP, uh, which makes larger cells possible. Then you have the extended range frame, which in, in, increases the reach of the transmissions to a longer distance. And then dual carrier modulation, which is basically a repetition technique to improve the SNR at the cell edge. And finally, we have the target wake time, which is originally designed for uh, power save, uh, but it has other applications as well. Let's get into the special reuse. So before I go into the details, a quick recap of you know, two issues which have plagued Wi-Fi for many, many years, maybe decades. So let's consider a very simple scenario. We have one AP, one station. In this case, if either node wants to transmit, it will use CSMSCA, figure out you know, when the channel is available. If the channel is free, apply back off and then get ready to transmit. Now, when we introduce a second link in the same uh, BSS, then now you have a complex scenario where you need to look at you know, two different nodes and then figure out you know, if no, none of them is transmitting, then you are okay to go ahead and transmit. But if, let's say in this example, STA1 and STA2 are placed such that they cannot hear each other in the RF sense, then what will happen is that if an STA2 is transmitting, STA1 may not hear that transmission and may think that the channel is free and go ahead and you know, start transmitting, which will lead to a collision. But this is what we you know, know as hidden node problem. Now, this problem has been solved to some extent by you know, multi-user transmissions in 11AX where the access point can schedule transmissions on the uplink so that multiple stations can transmit at the same time in the, by splitting the frequency resources using OFDMA. So to some extent, that problem is, is less severe with OFDMA. The second problem is what we call as the exposed node problem. So here, if we add one more link, which is in the neighboring BSS, which is operating on the same channel, then when AP2 is transmitting to STA3, then STA2 has to wait till that transmission is over before it can transmit to its own AP, which is in this case is AP1. Now, it is quite possible, given the, the way the nodes are placed, that STA2 and AP2 could have transmitted in parallel without interfering with each other's transmission because their intended recipients were away from each other. So in that sense, you could still maintain the SNR, but given the way CSMA works, it's a very sort of a conservative scheme, tries to be very nice, polite, and hence you know, causes inefficiency in the system. So the hidden node problem you know, has been around for a long time, and uh, sorry, exposed node, and both hidden nodes. So the challenge now is, if, if we were to enable these two links, that is the AP1 STA2 and AP2 STA3 link to operate in parallel, then somehow STA2 has to be able to figure out which of the, uh, which of the BSS that transmission belongs to. Is that transmission coming from AP1 or STA1, or it is coming from AP2 or STA3? So if it was possible to figure this out, then maybe we could do something better than waiting for uh, the OBSS transmission to finish before we start the next transmission. So how can we do that? So this is where BSS color comes in. So this is a new feature introduced in 11AX where each BSS is assigned a color. And there are 63, 64 colors available, 63 colors available. So two BSS which are operating on the same channel can use different colors. So this way you are able to differentiate whether the transmission is coming from your BSS or somebody else's BSS. And the nice thing is that this color is put in the preamble. So as you start decoding the, receiving the packet, you decode the preamble and you look at the preamble and you are able to see what color this belongs to. So as soon as you see the color, you are able to figure out whether this transmission is from your BSS or some other BSS. So part of the problem is solved by using BSS color, which allows you to distinguish between transmissions which are 
intra BSS that is coming from your own BSS or inter BSS which are coming from a neighboring BSS and assuming that both these transmissions are co-channel. The second part of the problem is once you have figured this out whether it is an intra BSS frame or an inter BSS frame then can you do a simultaneous transmission and this is where special reuse comes in right because it enables simultaneous transmissions between in two BSS on the same channel at the same time right. So as expected you know IEEE when it solves a problem it gives you three different ways of solving the problem it gives you 10 rules to figure it out you know how do you use this feature and special reuse is no different. So there are three different flavors of uh, you know special reuse there is something called OBSS packet detect which we will talk in the next few slides there is something called special reuse parameter which is another way of doing it and within the OBSS PD mechanism there are again two flavors there is a non special reuse group and there is a special reuse group. So there are different things uh, or different motivations for using these different modes we will see how this works. So let us start with the very simple scheme which is the OBSS PD special reuse. So the basic idea is very simple you detect whether a frame is coming from your BSS or another BSS what is known as OBSS or overlapping BSS. That is the first uh, step so once you figure out that this frame is coming from another BSS that is a it is a inter BSS frame then you decide at what power you should be transmitting so that you do not cause interference to the original transmission or what we call as primary transmission. So let us take the first example on the left side where you have uh, two BSS BSS A and BSS B which are fairly close. What it means is that when BSS A transmits its signal will be heard very loud at BSS B. Now if, BS, if a node in BSS B detects that a transmission is happening in BSS A then it will look at the received RSSI and compare it against some threshold to see whether it is allowed to go ahead with the parallel transmission or not. So this threshold is called as OBSS PD level as you can see in the chart on the left side. Now if this power this uh, power of the received signal was less than OBSS PD level then a uh, parallel transmission can originate from BSS B which could be from the AP or the STA. However, there is a cost to it because now you are going to initiate a new transmission while another transmission is going on on the same channel. So what you need to do is to reduce the power of the secondary transmission so that the original transmission can be decoded reliably at its receiver. So the rule here is that if you are increasing your sensitivity uh, level let us say originally sensitivity level was minus 82 and now you set the sensitivity level or the OBSS PD level to minus 72 then you have moved 10 dB up your sensitivity level. So you have to back off in the power by the same amounts. So for example if your original transmit power was 20 dBm and if you change your sensitivity from minus 82 to minus 72 then your power has to reduce by a commensurate amount. So in that sense you are allowed to transmit but in order to play nice you have to speak softer. So it is almost like you know two conversations going in, in parallel in a room. So if both conversations have to make sense then both parties have to basically speak in a softer tone. So the same kind of principle is followed by uh, you know special reuse where we allow parallel transmissions with the rule that the secondary transmission has to transmit at a lower power. Now that lower power how much it is is dictated by the standard the specific formula I will come to that power calculation a little later. Uh, Let us look at you know what happens at frame level. Again there are two BSS here so uh, let us say the beginning BSS A the AP starts has a transmission ongoing so the two stations within that BSS detect this as a intra BSS transmission. So the normal CCA rules apply they will differ and they will you know wait for this transmission to be over before they can uh, start their back off timers. Now as soon as the transmission from the AP is over then both the stations start their back off timers. In this case the first station gets lucky its back off finishes it can it starts its own transmission. Now because again this is the intra BSS transmission for the second STA the second STA has to suspend its back off until this transmission gets over. Now as soon as this transmission gets over the STA again starts the back off but we find that there is a new transmission which started in the second BSS. Now because this is a OBSS transmission and in this case the received power of this OBSS transmission was less than the PD level therefore the station can continue its back off it will finish the back off so it does not need to defer it will finish the back off and then initiate the packet transmission. 
So this is how at a frame level, stations can detect, first of all, what is the, uh, uh, what type of transmission it is. And then based on you know, the power level, they can decide whether they can overlap with another transmission of their own, and they can continue uh, their back off or CSMA procedure and continue the packet transmission. Now let's go back to the power uh, equation again. So as I said, the rule is very simple, that you are allowed to change your sensitivity level from whatever minimum value you have, let's say it's minus 82. And if you find that uh, ongoing transmission is below that level, then you can go ahead and transmit, but you need to reduce your power by an adequate amount. So for example, here we see that the sensitivity level is set x dB above the OBSS PD min. Let's say OBSS PD min is minus 82. So now you have to reduce your power by x dB. So that's a, you know, the rule that we have. Now in this context, what IEEE defines is something called a reference power for both stations and APs. So the reference power for a station is 21 dBm. For APs, it is 21 dBm for a two stream or a one stream AP and 25 dBm for more than two streams. So let's say the, uh, if you look at it from the client's perspective, the reference power for client is 21 dBm. If the client sets the OBS speed level to, uh, let's say minus 72, which is 10 dB above the minimum value, then your maximum transit power for special reuse transmission will be 10 dB, 21 minus 10, that is 11 dBm. So that's how the power restriction is applied by the overlapping transmission. So this is uh, how, I mean, the equation is, uh, you know, uh, is from the spec and this figure basically shows you the operating region. How do you calculate what is the maximum power which is allowed? Now the obvious question is that, you know, if you're reducing the power, then what happens to MCS, right? So at full power, you might be using let's say MCS 11, but if you go down 10 dB in power, then obviously you have to reduce the MCS. So there is a, another cost to it. Even though you are getting more opportunities to transmit, but Typically, your MCS will be lower because now you are operating at lower power. So in order to maintain the SNR, you will have to reduce the, uh, your own uh, MCS. Of course, the original transmission, because it started before, it can use link adaptation or MCS selection as per normal logic. But the secondary transmission has to uh, have a different logic for uh, the MCS selection. And in the case of the this particular example, the OBSS PD level is determined by each node within the BSS independently. However, the AP has to communicate to all the stations what is the minimum and maximum value. Now, the default would could is, as, as per the spec, is minus 82 for minimum and minus 62 for the maximum. So in no case, if you receive a transmission above minus 62, you can do any SR. But if you receive a transmission within these two bounds, then you are eligible for SR, depending on what is the PD level that you choose, and then accordingly you shift your power uh, by the same amount. There's another flavor of this uh, scheme, which is called spatial reuse group based scheme, which is essentially trying to coordinate spatial reuse within uh, a network. For example, if you have a managed network where all the APs belong to you, it makes sense for you to have the same thresholds for all the APs or all the BSS in the network. So that way you can manage the interference even better. So this is where the special reuse group comes in, where you define a group of BSS, or essentially you select a set of colors. You say that these colors or any BSS which belongs to this set of colors will apply the same BSS, uh, OBSS threshold for minimum and maximum values. And this information is communicated by the access point of uh, you know all the access points within this group to their station. So each station will learn that these are the members of my group, and these are thresholds which need to be applied when figuring out whether a special reuse can be used or not. So this uh, signaling is communicated via a new information element defined the spec, which includes, uh, first of all, knobs to turn on or turn off certain flavors of special reuse, and then the corresponding uh, uh, parameters which govern the use of this uh, feature. So first knob is, uh, let's say, you know, you can disable the special reuse itself. So for example, the AP can announce that none of the stations are allowed to use special reuse. So there's a flag, AP can set, and the stations will know that special reuse is not allowed. However, if special reuse is allowed, and if that flag is unset, then the AP can communicate a specific upper limit for the PD, PD value. So minimum is set to minus 82. In this case, upper limit can be set anything 
up to minus 62. So that can be communicated by the AP to all the stations within the group and the stations need to adhere to that. In the case of SRG based, there is another information element, uh, part of the information element which contains the SRG specific information. So here for the SRG, we will communicate, the AP will communicate a minimum offset, a maximum offset and also which are the colors which are part of this group. So that way the stations can figure out when they receive a transmission from another BSS, does it qualify as an inter-BSS transmission and can they, reuse, uh, can they reuse the channel at the same time. Uh, so let us look at the thresholds again. So basically what you see in the figure is uh, the bounds are minus 82 and minus 62. The OBSS PD min offset is the delta between the minimum and the actual offset or the PD min. So that defines the PD min. So minus 82 plus PD min offset is actually the lower limit. And then minus 82 plus the PD max offset is the upper limit. So this becomes your boundary now. So let us say PD min offset is minus 3. Then you are raising the sensitivity to minus 79. And let's say the max offset is you know 20. Then you are raising the upper limit to minus 62, which is the maximum value. So this is your operating region now. So if you receive a transmission from another BSS with the RSSI, which is within these two bounds, then you are eligible to use this opportunity for special reuse. So that's how the rules work. So as I said, there are multiple flavors of this scheme. And we saw two flavors, which is the very simplest case where each BSS can independently decide what are the thresholds. And the stations can figure out based on the upper and lower limit whether they can reuse the channels uh, whenever the inter uh, BSS frame is detected. And there's the SRG scheme, which is more a coordinated scheme where a group of APs can decide to use the same thresholds and have a more coordinated special reuse. There's a third slightly more complicated, uh, but I would say more powerful scheme, which is given in the spec where you can do it at frame level. The idea is that the transmitter of the primary link can indicate whether another transmission can overlap with this frame or not. So in the, in the first case, we saw that it was like a general you know, uh, exemption was given to all the stations which are part of this that they can use SR. In this case, you can indicate in the original transmission whether you are going to allow a parallel transmission to happen or not. And to do this, basically we use a trigger frame. So the access point when it sends a trigger frame, it can, it can set a flag which says whether an overlapping transmission can occur with respect to this frame or not. So this uh, exception is only with respect to the this trigger frame or the packet which is scheduled by this trigger frame. So that's the first thing. Second thing is by using the information given in the trigger frame, the other stations in other BSS can figure out exactly what is the maximum power level that they can transmit with. So the scheme is a little bit complex, but uh, let me try to explain it uh, you know, with using a diagram. So here again, consider two BSS, BSS A and BSS B. So let us say the AP in BSS A sends a trigger frame. So in that trigger frame, it sets the uplink special reuse value to three, which basically indicates the uh, something called special reuse parameter. The value here in this case is minus 68. In fact, the table is from spec, so three means minus 68 and so on. Zero means SRP is disallowed. So if the AP had set value to zero, then no overlapping transmissions can occur with respect to this trigger frame. Or if the value was set to 15, then again, special reuse was prohibited with respect to this frame. Now in this example, the uh, AP has chosen the value three, which corresponds to a SRP value of minus 68. What it means, I'll talk about in the next slide, but for now, let us assume that this trigger frame was received by the other stations. So STA1 and STA2 received this frame. ST1, because it's coming from the same BSS, it's an intra-BSS frame. STA2, it's coming from another BSS, so it becomes an inter-BSS frame. Now, STA2 will look at this field, the special reuse field, and check whether this value is you know, anything other than 0 and 15. In this case, it is 3. So it calls it a SRP PPDU, and it notes down the transit or receive power of this packet. Now, subsequently, STA1 will do a uplink transmission based on the grant which is received in the trigger frame. Now, for STA2, the decision now is whether to use this opportunity or not, and then what power to use. So the power to use, in this case, the STA2 decides to send a packet, which I have marked in the green, SRPPDU. So that SRPPDU is now going to overlap with the PPDU coming from STA1. So this is the special reuse case. Now, the power of this SRPPDU is based on 
first of all the power which at which the trigger frame was received by STA2 which is essentially the RSI of the trigger frame or the preamble of the trigger frame and the SRP value which was indicated in the header of the trigger frame that the SIG A, the uplink special reuse field. Let's see what really this you know uh, power, how do we calculate that. So the SRP power is basically sum of the transmit power of the original AP that is AP1 in our case plus acceptable interference level. So transmit power of AP, AP can decide the acceptable interference level is essentially saying is a value which means that if the other transmission is at that level then the original transmission can be decoded by the AP with reliably with 10% packet error rate. So essentially the acceptable interference rate is the uplink target RSI which is given in the trigger frame minus the SNR at which the uplink packet can be decoded by the AP reliably. So just to give you a little bit more insight into this, let us say the uplink target RSI was minus 60 dBm and the SNR target was 15 dB with a 3 dB margin, so we get total 18 dB. So now minus 60 minus 18 becomes minus 78. So that is the level of interference that the original AP can tolerate while receiving the packet from its own, within your, its own BSS. If this target uh, RSSI was let's say minus, uh, minus 50, then obviously the original transmission is at a higher power, so you have get another 10 dB margin. So your uh, acceptable interference level is higher by 10 dB. Little bit of you know simple maths to give you a little, you know more understanding. So let's go back to the equation that I showed you earlier. Uh, that the SRPPDU power is le is basically less than SRP value minus RSSI of SRPPDU. So what it means? So this is the equation we start from. We replace SRP value with the you know what I mentioned in the last slide is TXAP1 plus interference. If you rearrange the terms. The quantity in the bracket is transit power of AP1 minus received power of the transmission from AP1 at STA2, which is nothing but the path loss between AP1 and STA2, right? If I move this to the left, again, if you focus on the term in the bracket, we have transit power of STA2 minus path loss between APA1 and STA2. Assuming path loss is reciprocal, you can replace it by path loss between STA2 and AP1. So the term on the left is nothing but the RSSI of the SRPPDU at the AP which sent the trigger frame. So effectively what we are saying is that the RSSI at which the parallel transmission happens should be less than the acceptable interference level at AP1. So that will maintain the SNR at AP1 so that AP1 can decode the uh, transmission from its own station while another station in another BSS is transmitting at the same time on the same channel. So that's how we figure out what power can be used by the secondary transmission using the information which is provided in the uplink special reuse field of the trigger frame. So this is more de deterministic in nature because every station knows exactly what is the upper limit. So there is no, it's all simple math that you can do to figure out how to use it. But of course the challenge is that in every trigger frame the AP has to insert this figure. So the job, the hard part is at the AP side, the AP needs to figure out what is the acceptable interference level and that's what it needs to communicate to the other stations which are hearing this uh, transmission. Now all this was theory or you can say you know what is in the spec. Let's, let me take a few minutes to talk about you know what is the real performance of this, uh, these schemes. So we did two types of analysis, one based on simulation and one based on you know a test bed in our network. So the first case is where uh, we used a NS3 simulator to simulate a very simple network where we have two BSS, each BSS has three clients and we initiate uh, three flows from each AP. One is a video flow, one is a best effort flow and the last one is a background flow. So each station will receive one flow and the stations are dropped randomly in the, uh, around the AP so there is no uh, fixed locations. And so we considered three situations. In the first case, both the BSS operate on different channels. So obviously there is no reuse required. So here we found that the total throughput that each BSS got was around 67, 68 Mbps. Now the moment we put these two BSS on the same channel, obviously the throughput dropped. So from 68, uh, BSS A has a throughput of 43 and from uh, 67, BSS B has a throughput of 44. So obviously, you know, that's what is expected. But when we turn on special reuse, we see a small gain in throughput in both the stations. 
By small, I mean, you can see it's about 10%, right? So there is definitely a performance gain that we see in this very controlled simulation that we ran. The second example is where we put two base stations together. So this is a real test bed example. The previous one was a simulation. So two APs are you know, side by side. There are one station each connected to each AP. We start an iperf session on the downlink from AP1 to STA1, AP2 to STA2, 200 Mbps each we are pushing on each link. And in this case, the RSSI uh, of each link uh, was roughly similar between minus 72 to minus 75. And we set the OBSS PD level to minus 70. So when we ran this experiment with the two BSS on separate channel, then the throughput we got was very close to the offered load. So the offered load was 200 Mbps per BSS. And we got close to 200. So the aggregate throughput we had was 305 Mbps. Now when you put both the APs on the same channel, so obviously the throughput dropped. You can see from you know, 395, it went down to 285. So almost 25% drop. Now when we enabled spatial reuse in this situation on both the, uh, both the BSS, then we found that's almost you know, 12, 13% increase in throughput in, in the aggregate throughput. Of course, what you see here is that one of the BSS benefited more from uh, spatial reuse than the other one. So from 145, BSS A went to 149. And from 140, basis B went to 173. So there is some imbalance in the gain. But overall, if you look at the system level, we find that there is between 10 to 15% gain that we see when we turn on special reuse in this type of control experiment. Of course, you know, this is a very simple experiment, you know, just two clients. But, uh, you know, we have to see how this works in more dense scenarios. So just to summarize, um, Special reuse, you know, solves uh, the problem of, you know, uh, allowing multiple transmissions on the same channel at the same time, which can improve the spectral efficiency. Basically, you can send more bits per second per hertz. So overall, you know, its utilization of spectrum will increase. And there are three flavors which are given in the spec. Today, in most of the APs, what you see is the first flavor, which is the uncoordinated mode, non-SRG or basis PD based. Uh, I've not seen at least any vendor uh, talking about SRP based or even the coordinated base. The first one is where you see most of the AP vendors have enabled this feature. And if you look at, uh, you know, there are a lot of literature in, some, in terms of, you know, theory on how it will work uh, uh, and what performance gains you see. And what I've shown you is two very, you know, simple scenarios, one with simulation, one with real test bed, where we can see that there is some gain uh, between 10 to 15% in a very controlled situation. But we have to see when we put in, you know, more complex scenarios, whether you really get this gain or not. I think that the real challenge is how do you set these levels? And as with all things Wi-Fi, there's no simple way to figure it out. And to paraphrase Peter from last WLPC, selection of this OBSS PD level might be more of an art than science. That's at least early assessment that I have from all the experiments that we have done with this feature in our, in our lab and, and simulations. Thank you.